Okay, so the first thing I want to talk to you guys about is um, sort of where we start with human physiology. So I'm going to start so, from a place that you're familiar. Um, basically, a lot of human physiology, as you're seeing from this figure right here, um, it's going to involve um, getting things from one place to the other. Things, what do I mean? I mean, gas is in, gas is out nutrients in, wastes out, um, things in and out of the cells. So you're going to be doing a tremendous amount of exchange of materials. Now, a lot of the materials that you're exchanging, you have known for a while. So I won't be the first person to tell you that the human body takes oxygen in and gives carbon dioxide out. That's fine. You've known that for a long time. Or taste takes large macromolecules like sugars and amino acids medium-sized macromolecules in and puts the waste products out. That's no big deal. You understand that. Um, so a lot of times you are already relatively familiar with um, what is exchanged. Yeah? Oops, hold on. I'm getting used to this new thing. You guys be patient with me. Relatively familiar with what is exchanged. And you already might be familiar with how it's exchanged. Um, but where physiology comes in is the why. Okay. So um, why things are exchanged. So not just I need oxygen in and I need carbon dioxide out, but also why you need oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. So a lot of times when people get into physiology, they've got a decent amount of knowledge about this, about what, right? Okay, so I need oxygen, I need glucose, I need amino acids, I need those kinds of things. Sometimes you even remember how it's exchanged from 1610. You might remember that some things um, require channels and some things require carriers. Some things you can only get them in by endocytosis. You might remember all of that. Um, but you might not know why it's exchanged. So with human physiology, since it's really the study of function and it's the study of function in the human body, what I would like to get to is to sort of understand why it's exchanged. Like something that you might already know is that you need to get carbon dioxide out of the body, that it's a byproduct of cellular respiration. Um, but um, what happens if you don't? What happens if you can't get your carbon dioxide out of the body? So that's going to be really important because that's going to expect uh, uh, impact the physiological function. So if you can't get carbon dioxide out of the body, one of the things that we'll learn in this set of notes, and then again, multiple times throughout the semester, is that it's going to impact the pH of the body. And why would you care if it impacts the pH of the body? Well, if you impact the pH of the body, the structures of your proteins start to change. So what we do slightly differently that we didn't do in other classes is that we really get an ability to understand how things are exchanged more deeply because you're not just going to memorize whether it goes through a channel or a carrier or is active or is passive or um, uh, uses endoexocytosis. You're going to understand um, how it's exchanged and how to predict a new molecule based on the other ones. And then the really important thing is that you are going to understand why it's exchanged. And then that leads you really quickly into pathophysiology, which is what if I didn't get rid of the carbon dioxide? What if I couldn't get the glucose inside my cell because I've got type 1 diabetes, for instance? Okay, so let's um, put this together with anatomy since some of you guys had anatomy relatively recently. So in order to get something from the outside of the body to the inside of the body, the first thing that I'm going to have to do is I am going to have to get it to cross an epithelial membrane, right? Because epithelial tissues um, are at the edges of things, right? And so I've got epithelial tissues on the outside. Of course, I don't do a tremendous amount of exchange on the skin, but in other places I do. I do epithelial uh, exchange, exchange across epithelial tissues at the respiratory system. By the way, this figure right here is just how physiologists sort of see the human body. Um, basically, it's just a big blob and it's got places where you can do exchange, obviously not an anatomically correct dra drawing, just a functional drawing. So if, for instance, I was going to follow oxygen, 
all the way from my respiratory tract into the inside of um, a cell in my little finger so that that cell in my little finger could do cellular respiration. Um, how many times would I ca cross an epithelial membrane? Just to sort of put it into context. So I'm gonna cross this one, the respiratory epithelium. So that's one. And then I'm going to cross this one. I'm going to cross the epithelium of the capillaries in the respiratory system, right? The capillaries surrounding the alveoli. And then of course, I'm going to circulate it back to the heart. And this is an oversimplification of cardiovascular system, of course. But I'm gonna circulate it back to the heart. And then I'm going to have to cross epithelial tissues again as I leave the bloodstream. You with me? And then um, none of that matters unless I can cross not an epithelial membrane, but a cell membrane to get into the cell so that I can do cellular respiration. And at each of these locations, guys, one, two, three, four, there is a transport mechanism that you will have to understand at some point. You don't have to understand it right now. So if we're just looking at um, the epithelial um, membranes that something must cross to get in and out of the body, what are the primary sites that I do exchange across epithelial membranes in the body? Well, we've already done one of, which, one of them, which is the respiratory system, right? Primarily gases, primarily oxygen and carbon dioxide are the important ones that we're going to cross there. But of course, I get most of my organic nutrients and my water, right? Um, through the gastrointestinal tract, right? So if, for instance, you ate a Snickers bar, you would take some salt and some sugars and some fats from that Snickers bar and you would absorb them primarily across the um, epithelium in your small intestine, although there's some other places as well. But still, this is the gastrointestinal tract. And then um, the other place is your urogenital tract. And really the urogenital are kind of separate, but um, a lot of times they will lump them together for these purposes. And if we're talking about, for instance, the kidneys where you would get rid of urea, um, which is a nitrogenous waste product that is produced primarily by, from the breakdown of proteins in your diet, I would get rid of urea at the urogenital tract, right? And I would get it um, rid of it at the kidneys. So. Um, those are the primary sites at which I do exchange between the external environment and the internal environment. Um, and that makes them physiologically very important sites, but it also makes them pathophysiologically very important because those sites which have evolved for transport have to do transport for normal physiological functions. But it also means if you're set up for transport, you're not very good at blocking off everything. So the primary sites that you get exposed to pathogens are the same three sites that you're seeing here, the gastrointestinal tract, the, the respiratory tract, and the urogenital tract. And it's because, of course, they are supposed to do transport and sometimes they transport things like COVID that they were not intended to transport. Does that make sense? Okay, so after I get everything across the epithelial membranes, um, if I need to do anything with it inside the cell, I'm of course going to have to transport it inside the cell across the cell membrane. Also called the plasma membrane, but never called the cell wall, right? Because you're not a fungus and you're not a bacterium, so you don't have a cell wall. So you can transport it across the cell membrane. Okay. Um, and you should have done a decent level of understanding of cell membrane transport in 1610, but we do go through um, the transport as it refers to physiology in um, a set of notes after this one, maybe one or two after this one. Okay, so um, the last thing that I am going to cover, because I'm gonna make these um, videos relatively short with some quiz questions after them, the last thing that I wanna cover in this one is just body fluid compartments. So you have heard many, many times, of course, that the human body is mostly water. And it's true. Um, <clears throat> here is a diagrammatic representation of all of the water in the body, right? And um, they abbreviate that total body water, TBW. I don't use that abbreviation, but it just is fast to write down. So basically you have lots and lots of fluid. You're about 60% water. Of course, there are a lot of dissolved solutes in the water. Um, and the water can be roughly divided into the intracellular fluid 
and the extracellular fluid, the intra and extracellular fluid. Hold on just a second. Get that and move that down. Okay, so the intracellular fluid is here. Okay, and intracellular fluid is also often called cytoplasm or cytosol, and it is inside every single one of the almost 100 trillion cells that you have, but it's separate little pools of water inside each one. And then, of course, there is also the extracellular fluid, and the extracellular fluid is any fluid in the body that is not inside the cells. So the intra and extracellular fluid. Um, the extracellular fluid has a further subdivision. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this here. ECF is further subdivided into um, plasma, also called blood plasma. Blood plasma is specifically the extracellular fluid that is found around your blood cells, right? So that's relatively easy to understand. And then the other fluid is the interstitial fluid. Um, and it's inter, not intra, interstitial fluid. Those are both considered um, extracellular fluid. Interstitial fluid is any fluid that is extracellular fluid that is not blood plasma, pretty much. There's a little bit of other weird fluids in there. So uh, blood plasma and interstitial fluid are those two. Um, and so um, the extracellular fluid um, you can see right here accounts for um, about one third of the total body water and the intracellular fluid is almost two thirds of the total body water. So um, this accounts for most of it. There's also a little bit of other fluid that isn't really in uh, blood plasma and not exactly extracellular like the fluid in or not exactly interstitial like the fluid in your eyeballs and inside your joint cavities and stuff that fluid doesn't really play in very much because it doesn't turn over and exchange very well between the others so the um, extracellular fluid and um, the intracellular fluid right what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to have a mechanism of exchange between these so between the ICF and the ECF, the intracellular fluid or the cytoplasm or the cytosol, what has to happen is I have to be able to let things in and out, but still maintain them relatively distinctly different. So the extracellular fluid and the intracellular fluid have different compositions of ions. They have different concentrations. Um, they have different compositions of proteins. Um, so basically what happens is it's kind of like trying to keep things in your house um, while your door is all, always open. So I've got two golden retrievers. If the front door is open and I am not paying attention, they are outside the house. So how do you manage to allow for exchange while still controlling things? So many substances are going to have to have exchange between the ICF and the ECF. Um, and the ICF and the ECF are going to have exchange primarily um, through the plasma membrane, right? And the plasma membrane is going to really get to decide, not sentient, but it's going to decide what is transported and by what mechanism, primarily due to the chemical characteristics of the substance or solute that's trying to cross the um, primarily lipid plasma membrane. So um, let's say that uh, you have something lipid that wants to crop across a lipid membrane, not much problem in doing that. But if you have something large and water soluble that wants to crop a, across a lipid membrane, you're probably going to have to do something special to get it across, like a channel or a carrier, um, or sometimes even endo and exocytosis. So basically what it is, it's the, it's the interaction of the chemical composition of the plasma membrane and the chemical composition of the solute, the interaction between those that determines um, whether, how much, and by what mechanism something gets across the cell membrane. Okay, so um, last tidbit right here before I stop for today is that it's actually relatively expensive to have two fluids 
that allow for exchange between them, but they need to stay relatively independent. So for instance, you need to have a relatively high concentration of sodium in the extracellular fluid compared to the intracellular fluid. Um, and you guys know that when you give something with a concentration gradient the opportunity, it's going to diffuse straight down. So you're gonna to have to work hard to, for instance, keep the cool air inside your house, hot air outside your house with the door wide open. So a lot of energy is necessary to do that. So the body spends almost 60% of its energy simply re regulating the composition the volume, the temperature, and the pH of the intracellular and extracellular fluids in order to maintain homeostasis because you can't have a, a different composition or the same composition in the intracellular fluid as the extracellular fluid and have the cell function properly. So um, a logic question for you is, um, do you think that the body um, primarily monitors and maintains the composition of the ECF as a whole or the ICF as a whole. So it's just a logic question for you and it's totally fine if you do not get this right. So do you think that the body primarily monitors and maintains the composition, temperature, pH of the ICF or the ECF? Which one does it spend all of that money, that ATP, um, monitoring and maintaining. So some of you guys might want to say ICF. Well, because what's happening inside the cell is really, really important and that's totally a good argument. The ICF, however, is up to 100 trillion individual pools and I want you to think about how energetically expensive it is to monitor 100 trillion individual pools, most of which are not communicating with one another directly. Whereas the ECF, guys, right here is one slash two big pools because, of course, the blood plasma and the interstitial fluid have exchanged between them, right? And then, of course, the pool is also circulating. So what's happening in the extracellular fluid is going to circulate and get detected maybe here, maybe here, maybe here, maybe here. So let's just give you an example. Let's say I accidentally ingested a poison, right? And the poison doesn't start out, the poison when I ingest it accidentally, it doesn't start out in my intracellular fluid. When it gets absorbed, it gets absorbed here into the interstitial fluid. And then it gets absorbed into the blood plasma and then the blood plasma circulates. So my question is, when do you want to catch and launch a response to the poison. Do you want to wait until it gets inside the cell or do you want to catch it at some point when it's still outside the cell? So um, when it's still outside the cell, you have the opportunity to take care of it, the toxin, the pathogen, the poison, the whatever, before it impacts um, intracellular function. Um, so generally speaking, it's easier for us to maintain, monitor the extracellular fluid as one big circulating pool because, you know, if the pH were wrong and you could detect it here or here or here, you might be able to catch it before it impacted the cells. Um, so <clears throat> it's both more efficient to monitor the extracellular fluid, right? And also it's a bit more protective because you might be able to catch whatever it is before it impacts cell function. So what I wrote here is basically, if you let the composition of the extracellular fluid change much before you, before you catch it, like if you severely disturb the homeostasis of the extracellular fluid, then the composition of the intracellular fluid will change. And then the cell function will change. And then you may have some pathophysiology problems, right? And you can become diseased in a cell and then a tissue. And then you get a patho issue. Um, pathophysiology is the study of disease function. So um, the last thing before I stop this video is that do you think that we know everything about physiology and pathophysiology for every poison, for every organism, for every possibility. We certainly don't. Um, so it's still partially understood. Now the partial is huge, but it's not all encompassing. For instance, with the COVID thing that we've been going through, why did we not know 
um, where this organism actually attached to the respiratory epithelium. Well, because we'd never seen the organism before, and even though it's similar to other coronaviruses, we did not have that mechanism understood. Um, so physiology is still only partially understood, and to some people they find that very frustrating. To me, I find it really interesting because I will never, ever, no matter how much I do, know all of the answers to this. So lots of physiology research is still going on. We're still filling in the blanks, which means that things that you were taught before, you may get a different understanding of now. Things that I teach you now, um, you may actually modify your understanding of in the future. It doesn't mean it's all garbage. It doesn't mean we don't know anything. It means that because, of course, we are scientists, we are always open to better um, interpretations, more data, more information. Okay, we're stopping there for today.